Welcome everyone to the analyzing stream flow data using Surfer's Grid Correlogram. Uh, hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be the host for today's presentation. So we really have a great webinar uh, for everyone today where we're going to delve into using Surfer in an alternative way by showing you a, a few projects um, that Dr. Rick Kaler, uh, with, who is one of our power users and our guest host today, uh, created using a somewhat hidden technique in Surfer. Uh, using the grid uh, correlogram. Now, I'd like to start out um, our webinars usually by giving a little bit of background uh, about myself and then also a little bit about Rick, our guest host. Now, I'm working in my 13th year here at Golden Software, where I'm a member of our tech technical support team and also an account manager. At times, I also work as the training coordinator uh, for all of our apps here at Golden Software. I'd also like to introduce you to Rick Kaler, who is the founder, the owner, and the CEO of Visual Data Analytics, and is the innovator of the data visualization techniques uh, on the projects we will be uh, discussing today. And here's a little bit more uh, about Rick's background. His experience is in water resources, uh, which goes back over 30 years, uh, including being the director of water resources uh, for an environmental consultant company. Um, he also worked as the chief hydrologist at Cochise County uh, in Arizona and as a forecast hydrologist, hydrologist with the National Weather Service. Rick also attended the University of Arizona where he earned his BS in watershed and natural resource management, his MS in uh, hydrographic sciences uh, from the U.S. Naval Postgrad School in Monterey, California, and then also his PhD in watershed management uh, with a minor in remote sensing and image analysis, uh, also from the University of Arizona. His disser dissertation research uh, addressed big water, uh, uh, excuse me, big data in water resources, where he focused uh, his work on raster-based uh, analysis and visualization uh, of hydrologic time series data. So Rick, can you uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and say hi real quick? All right. Hello, and thanks to everybody for attending this webinar. Yeah, all right. So uh, thank you, Rick. After the discussion today, um, we're going to stop for a few minutes to answer any questions that may have came up. So if you do have any questions, you can send those on over uh, to our webinar team using the QA button, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, and you can send those in at any time. Um, you can type in your question. It'll be sent over uh, to our webinar team where... Uh, uh, either one of us will answer it, um, uh, and if we don't get to it, we will um, follow up in a timely manner via email. So we're also recording today, so um, after we're finished, we'll be uh, posting a video on our website, uh, support website, that's support.goldensoftware.com, uh, and uh, all right, that's enough for me, ladies and gents. Let's go ahead and get started, and I'm uh, going to go ahead and pass it on over to Rick. All right. Thank you, Drew. <clears throat> so today we'll be talking about different ways of interpreting an alternate way of looking at autocorrelation for time series data. Uh, this is mainly a, a qualitative approach, but I think it can be helpful in a lot of different ways when you're analyzing time series. So with that, let's go ahead and get started here. There we go. Just so everyone is on the same page here. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with time series, but when I talk about time series, it's just measurements, um, consecutive points in time, usually equal intervals apart. Uh, autocorrelation literally means self-correlation. You'll see other terms used for this lag correlation, serial correlation. And this whole purpose is to find similarity of the time series when it's lagged or shifted against itself. The purpose is to find things like frequency or periodicity, uh, persistence or randomness within a time series data set. We usually use a value called the correlation coefficient. It varies between minus one and one. We'll either use the letter R or the Greek letter rho. And to measure this self-similarity over these different shifted time periods. This is not to be confused with something called the coefficient of determination, which varies from zero to one, and it's an R squared value, so all the values would be positive. The formula for this is pretty straightforward. 
where k is the number of lags that we're talking about. And it's a couple of summation series here. The top part is the unshifted minus the mean times the shifted value times the mean. And we sum that over the uh, period that we're looking at, depending on the lags. Uh, we divide that by the summation of the unshifted minus the mean squared. Now the statisticians are gonna notice that this is very similar. If we take this value and divide it by N, we have the variance down here. If we take the value here and we divide it by N minus K, we get the covariance on the top here. Now it's important to know that as we get larger number of shifts, there are fewer and fewer data pairs to sum up. And so this will decrease as we increase the number of shifts, whereas the bottom is gonna be fixed. So we'll see a fading of this R value as we increase the number of shifts here. So what am I talking about? Let's look at uh, two hydrographs here. These are exactly the same. One is red, one is blue. And when I talk about lags, I have to make a note here. This is not the same thing as lag time that you'll see in some sort of watershed analysis. Lag time is the time interval between the center of the excess rainfall and the peak runoff that we're getting at a stream from a watershed or a catchment. Uh, I am not talking about lag time. I am talking about lag, which is a shifting of the data compared to itself. So if I have the red and the blue perfectly overlaid on each other, there is no lag. And so the K would equal to zero. Now in this case, the correlation coefficient will always be one because any data set compared to itself will always have a correlation coefficient of one. Now here, I've shifted the red from the blue by 50 days. So now my lag or my shift, K, is 50. And so we would look at these pairs of data um, vertically on here, and that would be the data sets that we would compare. Now notice, if I shift the red from the blue, if I shift one forward, it's the same as shifting the other data set back. And so there'll be a symmetry on this that I'll show you in just a second. So I'm gonna pick a particular river here in the Western United States called the Merced. And it flows through some of the most beautiful scenery that we have in the US. It's in the Yosemite National Park. So there's no kind of human development upstream at this point. We have about 100 years of data going back to the uh, 1915 up through uh, today. And if we were to look at this data set and shift it one day or uh, lag one, you'll see that, that will get a correlation coefficient of 0.97. So that's kind of what we get here. But if we have that 50 day lag, not Surprisingly, we get a scatter of the dots here of the data point. And here, the uh, correlation coefficient drops down to uh, 0 0.25. Well, if we do this one day at a time over time here, what we get is this curve. And this curve is the correlogram. We always start at zero. There's that shift of one. There's the 0.97. Here's that 50, 0.25. Sometimes it's interesting to find out where it crosses the zero line here. And that's at uh, 73 day shift. We come down here and kind of bottoms out at about a shift of 200 minus 0.23. And then it starts to repeat itself because the peaks usually occur about the same time of year. So one year later, you're gonna have a correlation coefficient of 0.54. Well, what are you gonna do with this? depends on your strategy. Maybe you're in a study where you want to look at daily time steps. Maybe you want to do things on a weekly basis. So you're going to jump from zero to seven to 14, maybe monthly, maybe every 30 days you want to see what's going on here, or perhaps yearly, or you might have something else in mind. Here's a correlogram, but uses monthly time steps for the Salt River in Arizona. So we have the ones up here, then after one month shift, and then we get this kind of a pattern here. Uh, the lag one is most commonly used in hydrology as a measure of persistence. I would like to note 
that lag correlation is useful in investigating a phase shift or a uh, shifting um, over time if there's a forward or a back shift. This is from a USGS report that was done a few years ago. So that's what we have here. So what are we gonna do with this? Well, we're gonna look at patterns. If we have a random system that we're looking at, we'll always start at one, even a random data set when compared to itself, will have a correlation coefficient of one. Well, once we take a step away from that, we'll drop down and we'll uh, vary real close to a, a zero value here. So that's what happens in the random data set. Typically what you get is this cyclical pattern. And that's kind of what we see here for the uh, Salt River here. Uh, we're trying to find out uh, the persistence on this and pretty much for stream flow, today's stream flow depends on what was going on yesterday and today will affect tomorrow. So there's always some sort of uh, correlation that's going on here. Um, but we don't have to use these uh, line graphs. If we look at the Merced again here, this is a USGS line plot, and we get this kind of a plot here. Well, it turns out um, I was able to work with the USGS and they have this raster grid plot where we have the day of the year on the X axis and the year on the Y. And so we can represent the data not in a linear one dimension fact, uh, representation. We can actually use this dual time scale and create this XY system here. And you get to see a lot more subtleties in the data by approaching it this way. Well, Surfer has this wonderful tool called a grid correlogram. Excuse me. And it was developed for looking at maps, spatial. So they wanted to see how those values correlate across this spatial grid. So looking at spatial patterns and correlation, and it wants to measure this anisotropy of the spatial grid. Basically, they show the covariance as it varies with distance and direction across the grid. Well, time is, can be represented as a grid. Most hydrologic analysis methods assume time is linear. If you were to get on uh, Google and type in correlogram for time series, you would see nothing but line graphs. But the thing is, as we just showed, we can represent time in an XY fashion. Well, this tool from Surfer looks at data in an XY grid. We've created an XY grid. And so some of these tools meant for spatial can be used for temporal purposes. Uh, this temporal grid allows new ways for us to show what's going on and different ways to analyze the, the data. So what we're going to do is we're gonna create a temporal grid correlogram, whereas spatial patterns and correlation is what it was developed for. We can easily show temporal patterns and correlation of this grid. And before looking at distance and direction, well, we can see changes in time and timing across the grid. So we have some extra ways of in analyzing this data that we didn't really have before. So how is this accomplished? So we have a grid of values here. A, this is the same data overlaid on top of each other. Here is day 329 for year 1986. Here is day 329 for 1986. So if we shift one grid uh, along the x-axis, we have a plus one day lag. But as we shift forward the red, it's same thing as shifting the black back one day. So we're gonna get a, a, a symmetry here. We can shift one grid up one unit in the Y direction, and that's a one year lag. Or we can shift up and over. So now we have a one day, one year lag as we look at these pairs of data that are overlapping. So the correlogram is going to be showing A at the center here, where there's zero daily lags, zero yearly lags right there in the center. That's A. B, shifting it forward one day, 
well, it's the same as shifting the other one back one day. So we see a symmetry in that direction. If we shift one unit in the y direction, we get to see that the C value, the correlation coefficient for that analysis appears above and below. And finally for D up and over, we get this pattern here. Well, we look at the values in this grid and if we go along here with a zero uh, yearly lag, but we are showing daily lags, we actually have the values for a daily correlogram. If we look in the y direction where we have no daily lag, but all yearly lags, we're gonna create a yearly correlogram. So we're getting kind of a lot of information out of this grid when we take this approach. So why even do this? I mean, this is kind of interesting. What are we gonna get out of it? Well, it's gonna increase our understanding of the system. Certainly it's gonna provide insight to things like persistence and system memory. We can find changes, jumps, shifts, trends, um, alterations, um, way to validate model output. Maybe you're trying to model a natural system and this will be able to help for what's going on here. We can validate, uh, or rather, we can communicate the results. Sometimes a well-graph, a well-conceived uh, graph helps people understand with a picture rather than a table of numbers. And hopefully if there's decisions to be made, this can improve the decisions, uh, the decision makers ability to figure out what's going on since it can support some of this decision support here. So what's the workflow that we have going on here? Well, for me, we're gonna take a linear time series and we're gonna convert it to this raster dual time scale. Now, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of this because there was a webinar I had given through Surfer earlier um, that delves into this with much more uh, attention to detail. And go ahead and look at this webinar and you'll have an idea of what's going on here. But we, we gotta take this linear and we gotta convert it to a dual time scale. Once we do that, we're gonna turn this into a Surfer grid file. And I'll show you this with a example data set I have here in just a minute. Um, I would suggest as we go through this, we've got a data name dot grid. When we go through the Corillagram tool, which is super simple to use, we're gonna take that data grid and turn it into a Corillagram grid. The default that they have in Surfer is to name this output out.grid. Well, pretty soon you're gonna have a lot of out.grids there and it's like, which one goes with which? I would suggest you name your output data name underscore Corel. That way, you know it's a Corellogram for this data set. It just goes a whole lot smoother for data management if you uh, take some time to rename your output data set. Well, the cool thing is, once we do this, um, we've got a grid and Surfer allows creating color relief maps for any grid file, be it the stream flow, be it the grid parallelogram. It's really uh, something and we'll be looking at that here in just a second. You can overlay other information such as contours, at a specific level, and I've been using a zero contour uh, to help understand what we have going on here. Let me go through the slides and then hop out to Surfer and actually step through this. Um, up here at the top at the tabs, we see that there's the grids tab. Once we click on that, we get this root of N calculus symbol that pulls up a window that has some really interesting features, but we're gonna come down here to the foyer and spectral analysis, and there's the grid correlogram. And then you have that option. When we do this, you uh, decide on what input you have. You highlight grid correlogram, you get your output. I'm saying you look at your input, change the output to be underscore corel for what's going on. You can add this or create a new a layer if you want to, but the next thing I want to talk about is really, really important. Given my input uses day of year or a daily time step in the x-axis direction, the output grid file for the Corellogram 
means that in the x direction, the lag is in terms of days. It's going to go over one unit. Well, in the x direction, I've got my one unit as one day. My input data set, the y is the year, which means that the correlogram means uh, for the y axis, the lag is going to be in terms of years. What was the flow then turns into the correlation coefficient. So if you have something like um, hour and you have month, or maybe you have a minute and you have hour here, those values that you select for your X and your Y are gonna be rep uh, replicated here in the grid correlogram. So understand that you have this difference in units as you go uh, in different directions. Well, let me stop here for a moment. Let me hop out of this. Let me get into my surfer and let me step through this. Let me make this larger. So I've got some data prepared. I'm going to examine that for you in just a second here. So we go to grid. I come down here. There is that symbol for calculus. I click on calculus. Lots of options. I'm coming down here to Fourier and spectral analysis, grid correlogram. And I'm going to browse, and in here, I've already uh, created a folder for today's talk. Example data set, there it is. And I've got a Merced observed flow grid. So I'm gonna click on that, I'm open that up. So there's the name here. My output data set, I'm going to rename this Merced Observe Flow underscore C O R R E L. So now I'm going to create a new grid set, a grid file, only it's going to be based on the Merced Observe Flow, Corel. And once I look at this, yes, I've got the right input, got the right output. I'm not going to do anything other than just create the file. I say OK, and it's all done. So let's look at this a little bit closer here. It turns out, especially for this, uh, Surfer has a way of using different formats for output files for grids. And the Surfer 6 text is really quite helpful for what's going on here. So rather than show the actual grid, which is in binary, I'll show you the data based on this Surfer 6 format, which I'm going to open in Excel. So here we go. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Pull this over here. And then I'm also going to show you the resulting output for my correlogram here. And you see here, I want to. Show both of these at the same time. Uh, oh, well, this will be good enough here. So what I have over here is my input data set. I've got 366 days. I've got 170 years. My x-axis goes from day one to day 366 because there's leap years. It goes from 1915 to 2021. The minimum value we have is 1.5, and the maximum is 9,030. And so this first line is 1915, 1916, 1917. And so this large value here is what Surfer uses as a, uh, a blank data set here. And we have a leap year, and we have three years where there is no leap year, and then there's a leap year here. And so this is what we have. Now, what we have for the grid correlogram output, we still have 366 values. We have 107. But because Surfer only shift half of the data set, not more than half, it'll go from a minus 186 to 183. And for the years, since we have just a little over 100 years, it'll go from a minus 53 to 53. Well, if we look at 
halfway through the data set, it's just a flag for me that's not in the data set there. Halfway through, there's the number one. Exactly right. That's There's no shift in the daily and no shift in the yearly. And this is what's created from the Greek chronogram. And we're going to be plotting this up here. So that's what's going on here. What's interesting is basically you have the same number of um, data points here. So I'm not going to say that. I'm going to get this. The result is my observed data set is the same size as my grid corollagram data set because I have the same number of points that are in there. And so let's get out of this. I'll come back there. So let's do some exploration here. What I want to do is show some simulated conditions so we can understand what this grid corollagram graphic is showing us. So I'm looking at some extremes here, a random data set. I'm going to look at ideal stationarity, which I'll explain in just a minute. I'll do a time shift, see what that does, and different types of re repetition for the data. Then I'll bring up some natural flows, some managed rivers. And just to show you the variety of things that you can do with this, we're not going to stick just to hydrology. I'm going to look at snowpack, some air temperature, some Chinook adult. Uh, migration up the Columbia River, and even some insights into the geology that we have going on here. So let's look at some generated things, some generated data sets, and see what we have here. All right, we're going to look at random first, which is the boring one. We've got randomized flow. I had taken the average hydrograph for the Merced River, and I had just repeated it for every year, but then I just assigned each of those days a random number and sorted them, I get this mishmash. Well, here's what happens. Here's my grid corollagram down here, where the values of white right next to the red, that's all very low values, except for that little center square there. There it is, there's the one. So if I were to take a profile along this zero year shift, to look at a daily grid corollogram, by golly, it's exactly like that example I had earlier. You got that one value at one, and then boom, drops down and oscillates real close to the zero value. So this is what a randomized data set looks like. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is exact repetition. What I have here is this annual mean hydrograph, and I've just repeated it for every year and just stacked them together. So if you're to look at the 1920, 1921, 19, they're all exactly the same. So that's like it looks like we got this smear here. So these are all exactly the same. Now, the grid chronogram looks much different here. A friend of mine once saw this, he goes, wow, it looks like a Navajo rug pattern because they're always doing geometric patterns there. And I said, yeah, I, I can kind of see that. But what we have here is this area in the center very high persistence, very high memory. Well, yeah, it's the same in the X direction, but it fades because of that equation that we have. We have fewer and fewer data sets, uh, data pairs to sum up. It only goes through 50 years. And if we shift back, it's exactly the same. But I put in this zero contour and I can see that this is a straight vertical line. So this is an idealized situation that you'll never find in nature. But when I say ideal stationarity, that means the properties of the data set don't change with time. And so the, the data set is, is stationary. Well, yeah, I kept the exact same hydrograph as I go through here. Well, let's mix this up a little bit. What happens if we, we shift things from one year to the next? Here, I've got the hydrograph I've shifted over one day. Next year, I shifted over one year. Well, not a surprise, we get this slight, slight uh, um, sloping pattern here. But when we do the grid chronogram, it also shows that shift. And it's consistent in even zero contours are in this way. So we can use this chronogram to see if there's a, a shift in the data forward or backwards over time. Well, how about if we look at, I don't know, one year, it increases from one year to the next. I just increase things 2% per year. So I start off with the uh, basic uh, 
hydrograph. And then the next year for that day, I've increased the 2% and another 2% and so on and so forth. Well, I get this slightly altered grid coilogram where the higher values start to collapse onto each other and these lines are no longer uh, linear. They kind of curve into this. So, okay, I'm increasing. Well, let me, let me decrease it. Let's see what that happens. And now I started, but then I decrease it 2% per year. Well, they certainly look the same. Notice that they're not. I've, I've made the colors relative to the data set here but yet I've got a different scale down here. I wanted the blue to be the highest and the white to be the least, but I can see the patterns are the same. I'm looking at the grid correlograms, and even though they look identical, they're not. One is flipped from the other. Here I have an area of more bright red, a little deeper red. Here the bright red is on top and the deeper red is here. But it still shows that same kind of collapsing of the area of higher values. Okay, one last kind of uh, simulated value. I went ahead and took the decreasing, took these years, and then I just randomly shuffled the, each of those years, the values to come up with this kind of a pattern. So that's what we get. And when we do the grid correlogram, now we get to see something that's a little different here. We do see that higher area of memory, more persistence, and we do see that we get kind of this zigzag, this high frequency shift in the zero contour line through here. Okay, well now let's look at some real life examples here. I want you to remember this one. Okay, now we're shifting to observed data sets. Let's try that Merced River, the one that we saw that's in uh, Yosemite National Park. This is the actual data Look at that grid coronagram. Holy smokes. It certainly looks like what we had there. What does this tell us? This area of color that extends out shows that there is a persistence in the data. There's a lot of memory, which means the flows from one year to the next, at the higher flows or the lower flows, are going to be higher. Although we do get some variations as we go through, say, November from lower to higher but we get this kind of a pattern here. That zero contour line that we're looking at is vertical, which tells us overall the timing is the same as we move through the data sets. Well, let's look at another one. This is in Idaho on the Clearwater River above the Dwarshak Dam. Now, not quite as much uh, record here, but when we do this, we see that there is a definite shift to the left. We see this higher memory, so there is that persistence. There's not much development up in this area of the uh, watershed where the gauge is located, but we do see a seasonality timing change. It looks like the flows are occurring earlier, in this case, about six to seven days over the 2022 20, year um, area that are the period that we're looking at here. So we're teasing, teasing this out. There would be no way you could come up with this kind of a uh, interpretation if you looked at just the lag one value that we see here. And I guess you can kind of see that there is a shift to the left as we go uh, through the record here. Well, let's look at a managed river system. I'm gonna to go to the Snake River, which is in Idaho as well. Heise is just downstream of the Palisades Dam and Reservoir, which is in uh, Wyoming state right next door to Idaho. And this dam became operational in 1957. Well, I want to look at just before the dam was operational. And how does that change just after the dam is operational? Well, here it is before. This is the free flow period. Wow. It certainly is consistent with what we've seen before. This higher area of persistence fairly vertical zero line here. Well, let's see what happens when we look at after the dam is in place. Uh, definitely distorted. We can see this, this wavy pattern. We see that it's been shifted to occur later in the year. Uh, this wavy pattern appears to be influenced by this wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry operation releases uh, from the dam. 
You can also see that water from this water year, September, kind of flows over into the next uh, water year here in um, October. So that kind of jumps out at you. Let's look at one more um, managed river, which is the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry. Now this one is downstream of the Glen Canyon Dam, Lake Powell Reservoir, became operational in 63. So if I look before, this is before the dam was in place. This is the result of outflow from the dam. That free flow period, wow, it's pretty consistent for what we've been seeing for these snow melt driven systems in the Western United States. Once the dam comes in place, this is significantly changed. One of the things that jumps out, if we look up here at this record, you can see the higher flows in the May, June period. Well, we get this, this diagonal pattern. And if you look, actually it, it's, it's everywhere. But it turns out those are Sundays because they produce electricity at this dam and electrical demand decreases on the weekend. Less water is released through the turbines, so less water shows up downstream in the river. And so we've got this uh, regulation pattern in here. The result is, in fact, you can see this wavy line here, which is directly connected with the power production. You've got a highly randomized system here. The irony is the more managed a river is, the more random the flows are. It seems counterintuitive. My engineer friends just go crazy when I say, well, the more you manage it, the more you randomize the flows. And if you're an organism, you can't use the flows as an indicator when to spawn, when to migrate, uh, when to flower, because you are not sure what's going to happen from one year to the next. And that's kind of what we have going on here. Very interesting. Uh, Surfer lets you do a cross-section profile feature, which is great. So I looked at the yearly correlogram for free flow and the yearly correlogram for the uh, regulated period. And here's what I came up with. The blue is for the free flow. So the pretty good indication that you've got this persistence, this memory from year to year, whereas in the regulated flow, it starts oscillate around the zero here. So that's what we got going here. So we got a couple more examples here. Maybe instead of the releases, we look at the inflow into the lake. Well, we still see highly altered. We got to remember that the Glen Canyon Lake Powell has multiple reservoirs upstream of that. And the regulation we see from those streams or from those reservoirs upstream travel downstream and we can see how it can influence here. It's a little bit better than what we saw before, but the lesson is if we were to remove Glen Canyon Dam, we would not expect the river to magically go back to free flow period conditions, it's still gonna be altered by the other reservoirs upstream. We can look at a whole river system at once. Here's the Missouri River starting high up. It's the Yellowstone River in Sydney, Montana. And we go downstream and we come over here and we continue to go downstream, not knowing anything else other than what we just talked about. Which of those locations have the highest altered stream flow from natural conditions. Well, Wolf Point, Montana and Bismarck, North Dakota stick out like a sore thumb. This is just downstream of the Fort Peck Dam and Reservoir. Bismarck is just downstream of the Lake Sacagawea. And so how they regulate those and releases has caused highly randomized systems. As we move downstream, other reservoirs are operated differently. Here's Yankton. And as we move down through here, we can see that that high uh, persistence that we see in the yearly direction fades away. So as we move downstream, the flows become more and more randomized than what they were from the upstream flow. So you can look at a whole river system at a glance to get an idea of what's going on here. Uh, geology, 
you can actually kind of get an idea of geology. So here's this one in the Cascade Mountains, moderate to high soil permeability. Water gets into the soil very easily. We see the, uh, the flows here and you got kind of a smearing effect. So as the water comes and infiltrates and is released later from groundwater, you get to see this smeared out pattern. And we look at the, uh, the grid program, we see, yeah, there is a persistence here from day to day. It, there is some memory as we move in from year to year. But if we look at one location very close, Lookout Creek, here, Western Cascade geology, very low soil permeability. We have bedrock very close to the surface. So when it rains, it immediately runs off. And we have a very flashy, highly reactive kind of a system here. If you look down here, the great corellogram, bingo, absolutely. Very short persistence from day to day, but certainly no memory within the system. What this would tell us is this is exactly what you would expect as development occurs upstream and you have less water being entering into the soil profile and running off because of hard surfaces. If I'm looking at desert streams, say in the Arizona area, which react to rainfall, especially summer air mass thunderstorms, that it's a very flashy stream, we would have this kind of a, a grid corellogram. But looking at the two here, we have an idea of what the uh, general geology is on this. And one more example here. I was kind of curious. I had this water supply data set where we're looking to forecast water supply for an area, well, in this case, Colorado, 35 years of a model simulation. And I went from wet down to dry. So I sorted these based on the amount of water flowing through the system. And I have a contour here of 20 acre feet per day value. And then I've identified when the maximum was for uh, the data set for a particular simulation. And I'm looking at this, I go, okay, let's do a grid correlogram. And here's what I got. And I certainly see a time shift, but I'm going, whoa, this is shifting to the left. This is shifting to the right. What did I do? And I'm thinking, I went, oh, duh. I increased my y-axis downward. If I were to keep it as a positive, increasing the x upwards where I have wet to dry, now it matches what I got over here. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, we can use this for snowpack. Here's snow water equivalent. Here you have high snowpack, low snowpack. And here's the grid correlogram down here. There's that wavy pattern of flood, or high, low, high, low. But there's also a shift to the left, which we're seeing uh, from, we believe, climate change, where flows happen earlier. If I go back to, oops, this one, flows from a large snowpack occur later in the season. Drier conditions happen earlier in the season. You can see that the melt has also changed. Well, what would be the driving of the melt? Air temperature. So we look at air temperature for this same site and rather than individual days, I just broke this into bands to see some patterns a little bit easier cold, medium, and warmer temperatures. Well, I look at this and this area of high uh, correlation memory certainly seems pretty persistent. I can't see any shift there, but when I look at the zero correlation line, now it seems to mimic what we have here for the snowpack. And it's like, yeah, I can see how these two would be worthy of higher investigations if I was a researcher. And finally, we don't have to look uh, splitting it in half, we can uh, pull out vertical slices of this. Now this is salmon uh, migration. Actually, uh, we've got a spring, a summer, and a fall salmon run here. So I extracted just that fall migration and created a grid chronogram of this. That's what I got. I wanted to have a little bit more uh, recent. So I did just the last 
50 years or so, 60 years. Oh, I'm sorry, from 1980 to 19 or to 2010. And I get a little bit more clear picture of what's going on. We see that collapse that we were talking about before. There is some persistence, but it doesn't last too long. And we can see that over time that this fall run certainly has had more salmon moving up the Columbia than it did before. So what are we going to do with this? Where are we standing? Right now, this is a qualitative analysis. Certainly is easy to generate. We can get those pattern identifications of timing changes. Management effects seem to pop out pretty easy. We can see if there's a consistent or reduced system memory of this. We can use this for multiple environmental data sets. And once you get a grid, you open yourself up to the, the other tools that Surfer has for graphing the options there. So quite a, a useful tool. And with that, I'll stop yakking and see if there's any questions. So thank you. Um, data set for uh, groundwater monitoring. Yeah, you can use this for any time series data set. Absolutely, what would a shorter uh, represented, what would be a shorter representative data set uh, for groundwater? Well, it would depend on the system. Certainly, if you have a aquifer that has uh, more a uh, uh, um, quicker movement through the system, yeah, you would see some things that change on a, on a faster schedule there. But you could, you could do any any time set on this. Um, I'll be working with Drew, so we can have a sample data set that you can download and use along with the color scale that I have, absolutely we'll make that available through um, Golden Software and Drew. And I wanted to follow up on that, Rick. We will make the data set available um, at the same time the video is available, which everybody that's participating today and everybody that registered should get an email that has links to download both of these or to access both of these. So just keep your eye out. That'll be sent out in the next uh, handful of days or so. So and I'd like uh, to go ahead and turn. Yeah, and I was going to say, if anybody else has any uh, questions for uh, Rick, please, uh, by all means, shoot those on over. Oh, uh, yeah. And here's my uh, my work email, visual.data.analytics. Feel free to get a hold of me. I would be happy to work with anybody who uh, wants to investigate this further. Um, if you want for your company to have a a Zoom meeting, or you want to have a working approach here on what to do, I'm more than happy to work with anybody. Just send me uh, a note and let's coordinate and see what we can do to help you better use this idea for your work. Okay, Greg, I put a couple more questions there in your chat. Yeah, I see William Turner, thank you. Um, yeah, especially when I did that simulation, the impacts of water availability on management. Yes, that would be something I think this could help uh, with uh, decision support ideas. Uh, question from Louise, uh, interference of groundwater from ejection field, measures every five minutes for three months. Sure, let's see what it does. Um, some of the times I would start these plots, I, I wasn't really sure what I would see. Once I saw this and I could interpret the pattern, it led me to then have a more focused research approach to understand how the system is working. So my idea is see what the data is telling you and maybe that can help you focus your resources and your research a little more um, effectively. So yeah, every five minutes for three months, I don't see any problems with that at all. This is new, this is different, but I think it has some potential that we haven't tapped into before. Could we make use of spectral analysis of Fourier for the same time series? Well, absolutely. Um, you could do a you know Fourier, Fourier 
to see what periodicity in the data uh, shows. I did that for the releases from Glen Canyon Dam as part of my dissertation. And certainly you would see a two day, seven day, uh, 30 day periodicities in the data that weren't there for the natural flows. The flow of a river in the natural system is not on a monthly basis. Monthly doesn't mean anything to a river. That's an artificial construct that we have for time. Season, seasonality, and now that makes sense and that would show up. But for the artificial data sets or the releases from the dam, you superimposed onto the, uh, the river system these extra uh, frequencies that do not occur in the natural system. Hope that helps. From a double porosity logarithmic flow rate. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not following you, I'm sorry. Um, but if you do have a time series that is from a uh, model simulation, certainly you can do that as well. Well, if you notice on my time scales for the flows that I showed, I've done a, a logarithmic conversion of the flows. So um, we'd have, first of all, more normally distributed data set, plus it dampens down the higher flows so you can get to see the patterns that are uh, occurring in the lower uh, stream flow uh, ranges. But yeah, sure, why not? Again, there's my email address that people have. Can we replace time by space? Well, actually, that's what we have is a map. What you could do is you could add time and space, such as the, um, the snowfall. You could look at regions that have the same time shift. Look around and create these different grid parallelograms and assign those to different locations and see if there's a, a regional effect that's popping up. So you could, um, I guess that you might be what you mean there. Earlier slides, there's a matrix moving left to right, up and down, southwest, and so on, moving down. But that, that comes from the way Surfer looks at the data, it does that shift. So you do have a one year up and back. So if you remember, I had A, B, C, D. There is an E there as well. So that's also part of the calculation. So it moves it up and back, down and uh, forward and back, up and down across the whole range of possibilities. So I think that's what you mean. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? It looks like we're getting up um, pretty close to our hour time limit here on the meeting. Again, I want to thank everyone for um, being interested in this topic, and I hope that you're going to step away from here with some uh, new ideas that maybe you can use in your work. Yeah, thank you very much. And this uh, uh, concludes our presentation uh, today. I hope everyone found the information that Rick covered uh, useful and applicable to their workflows. Now, if you have any additional questions on what was covered today, um, you're more than welcome to contact Rick. You can see his um, email address right there uh, on the last slide. And then uh, you can also contact us at support at goldensoftware.com. We'd be happy to, to uh, assist you. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Golden Software and uh, on behalf of Rick, we thank you for your time and everybody have a great afternoon. Take care, everybody. Andrew, can we stay on for a few minutes just as a wrap up?